Good evening, everyone, and thanks for coming. It was a bit of short notice. So the context of this talk is uh, there was a wonderful talk given by one Dr. Vijay Shankar, who is an Apollo neurosurgeon and a movement disorders expert, uh, just a few weeks ago, I think. It was a wonderful talk. He has a lot of experience, you know, experience and training in several international centers in movement disorders. He talked about uh, the PD, this Parkinson's disease, the symptoms, and various treatments available in the current state of art. So that created some interest in the community. So I thought, uh, why not follow it up with a talk on computation models? Because uh, in, a, in a clinical neuroscience setting, you can talk about what the symptoms are like and how do they look and how do you treat them and things like that. But if you want to explain why they are like that, why are the symptoms like that, why does a treatment work whenever it works, you know, to use the use language of mathematics. Because in, as scientists and engineers, that's the only way we know how to explain things. So in that context, I'll talk about, you know, this, our work on uh, modeling the basal ganglia to understand Parkinson's disease. Uh, this is a photo of about one and a half decades. So my lab is called Laboratory for Computational Neuroscience. Our long-term goal is to develop a model of, a, of the whole brain, a simplified model, because the real brain has about 100 billion neurons. But the hope is to develop a kind of a reduced model having about 1 to 10 million neurons, so quite a small model, but it should have all the major elements of the brain. Uh, major components like that, you know, cortical areas, sensory, you know, uh, subcortical areas, and all. But this is a long-term goal. So we are trying to basically build a different parts of this and assemble them over a period of time, right? Uh, so that they are all functional. It's not just you know, just you don't just have a structural input. Uh, you have various parts which do what they're supposed to do, and then you assemble them all for a long period of time. So there are several uh, you know, lines of work going on in the lab. Uh, I'm going to talk now about. Uh, modeling the basal ganglia to understand Parkinson's. So basal ganglia is first of all a subcortical circuit. So I'll try to minimize jargon as much as possible. So you know, brain is, right, you know, it has two hemispheres. There is this surface of the brain, which is a sheet of neurons uh, called the cortex, right? So that is where you have neurons present, you know, uh, located, uh, you know, big part of them. They are also deep inside the brain, there are other masses of neurons. Since they are located Inside the cortex, they are called subcortical structures. So there are many such uh, structures. So basal ganglia is actually a circuit of many such uh, subcortical structures. Right, it has uh, seven or you know, six or seven you know, modules. Uh, they call them nuclei, but you can just call them modules. Right, in uh, Parkinson's disease, which is a you know typically a kind of elderly disease, disease of the elderly. Right, a part of the basal ganglia gets damaged. So so study of basal ganglia becomes very important if you want to understand Parkinson's. So basal ganglia circuit, you know, if you draw it in a more uh, like a block diagram fashion, because that then it looks clearer. Then if you look at the anatomy, it looks very complicated. It can be drawn like this, it can be shown like this. So you have input coming from the cortex. Since it's a particular structure, it receives input from the cortex. And output goes back to the cortex. So, uh, so the striatum here is the input port. Then the output goes via two output ports. GPA and SNR. I don't, I'm not trying to expand all these abbreviations because it doesn't matter. You can just call them XYZ if you like. Right, and then uh, goes to thalamus and back to the cortex. So there is a short connection from striatum to the GPA and SNR, uh, which is called a direct pathway, and for obvious reasons, there's a direct connection. Then there is a longer route from striatum to GP and STN and GPI, uh, which is called indirect pathway because it's a longer route. So there are a bunch of connections I won't We'll get into it right now. We'll come back to this later. And then there is this little module called uh, the Substantia Negra Pars Compacta, or SNC, which is where you have a special kind of cells which is, release a substance called dopamine. Now, these cells uh, are the ones, these are the culprits, right, in, in Parkinson's. This is where you have loss of cells, and we don't know why it happened. Therefore, that's why it is called idiopathic disease. Because in biology, we like to use fancy jargon to say that, hey, we don't know. Even for that, we like to use fancy jargon. So we don't know why these cells are dying, uh, but they do die in Parkinson's because of that you have symptoms in many areas. Uh, so that is a problem. To a problem is to understand why do you see all these symptoms in Parkinson's because of loss of cells in this tiny part. It's a tiny part because it has only a few lakh, few hundred thousand neurons, which is very small compared to 100 billion neurons in the brain. So why is this small part of the brain so influential? Now, like I was saying, if you because of damage to this tiny part of the brain, there can be, uh, so if you look at the brain's uh, major domains of function, you have sensory motor function, you have cognitive function, then affective function, that is emotional function, and then finally you have autonomic function, that is, you know, control of our internal organs. 
So four major domains. Anything that you do will come under. Uh, anything that brain does will come under one of these four categories. Because of loss of cells in this tiny part, uh, you can see symptoms showing up in all these four major domains of brain. So, so basically, it has has such a strong uh, hold on all the brain functions. So there are many functions of basal ganglia. So this is going under one very short list, but you can make the list much longer if you like, right? And people have tried to model various functions using computational models. And uh, typically, the way that's happening right now in computational research, which is something that's not very satisfying about the way the field is going, is that for different functions, you have come up with different models. And then models, different models don't have any connection. There's no coherence. So therefore, if you have 10 functions, you'll have 10 models, right? Which doesn't make any sense because it's the same basal ganglia doing all these functions. So you need to come up with a unified model which can explain all these functions. And that is still kind of a bit of a uh, long-term goal. So the situation when we got into this field is something like this in a blind uh, mom's trying to figure out what an elephant looks like. Each person thinks it is, you know, it looks like a pillar, looks like a snake or rope or whatever. But the problem here is uh, to put all these little pieces and uh, come up with an integrated picture of the elephant here, which is the basal ganglia. So like I was saying, PD is a disease of the elderly, but there's also something called young onset uh, Parkinson's. It's a progressive neurodegenerative disorder because once loss of cells begins in this part, this SNC, it keeps continuing. And we don't know, we don't fully understand why these cells are dying. But once the disease sets in, you have uh, something called cardinal symptom. That is a, uh, main symptoms of Parkinson's, these are tremor, which you see typically in extremities, rigidity, rigid, rigidity of joints, postural abnormalities, this is people walk with a bit of a stoop, like you can see in this picture here. And bradykinesia refers to slowness of movement. Brady is slow and kinesia is movement. So like I said, you can have symptoms showing up in all the four major domains, but if you look at sense motor domain alone, you can have problems in, you know, again, why many submodalities of motor function like reaching movements, that is, how do you move your hand to reach and grab something, or handwriting movements, eye movements when you try to look at something, uh, movements of speech, right, posture, right, you know, it's it's very uh, gait, right, you, you can really wonder what is not affected, you know, because of PD. And in this, on the right bottom, you see this picture of uh, normal handwriting of an elderly person and uh, PD handwriting of an age-matched uh, patient, right, so it's Tamil words, Sri Ramajayam. You see that the letters are very small in PD, as this is called micrographia. Now, let us begin with the classical view, then we'll talk about uh, kind of the kind of view that we have been developing. So, if we take a textbook on neuroscience, like for example, the Bible, Candle and Schwartz, uh, right? The picture of basal ganglia function looks something like this. I, I'm not sure what happened in the, what's happening with the more recent editions, but an older version will look something like this. So you see that there is this direct pathway going from striatum to GPI and going out. Uh, it goes back to the cortex, then the longer, then indirect pathway. So now the SNC neurons release a substance called dopamine, like I said before, into onto the neurons of striatum. So it so happens, again, I, I won't go into all the neurochemistry and all this stuff right now, but the simple picture is the information coming from the cortex, right, uh, to the striatum. You can think of the dopamine as acting like some kind of a valve right as controlling a valve located in the striatum if dopamine is released to the striatum is high then valve is turned so that information goes straight along the direct pathway to gpi if the dopamine level is low the valve is turned so that information goes to the side route via, via the indirect pathway and back to gpi so so the, the, so the thing is if the direct pathway is activated it so happens that that will facilitate movement, that will enable you to move, that will allow, allow you to move. If the indirect pathway is activated, then that will block the movement, uh, right? So therefore, uh, when dopamine level is high, indirect pathway is activated, dopamine level is, uh, sorry, high, indirect pathway is activated, dopamine is low, indirect pathway is activated. Therefore, when dopamine is high, you get to move, when dopamine is low, you cannot move, you have difficulty moving, which is what happens in PD. This is a kind of simple explanation that was offered in some of the early textbooks and even some of the early papers like Alvin et al here from 89. But there is there is a larger uh, kind of uh, uh, understanding of dopamine, right? We need to, there's a large, larger background to dopamine, which is that dopamine is called the brain's pleasure chemical. It's a chemical that is associated with pleasure. That is when whatever gives you pleasure, right? That stimulus will invariably trigger release of dopamine somewhere in the brain. So for example, brain stimulation. So there are 
that there is this way of uh, electrically stimulating certain centers in the brain, which will make you happy, right? You know, it, it's like drugs. You know, if you can find, if you can somehow get a surgeon to implant electrodes into, into these reward centers in the brain, and uh, if you can wire it to some uh, some you know, switch, you'll keep on stimulating yourself. You will even forego food, right? It's so enjoyable. There are reward centers in the brain. Similarly, drugs, you know, psychomotor stimulants and opiates. Even food, we love food, uh, especially Diwali is in the offing. We know how you know, how pleasurable food is. All these stimuli stimulate dopamine release. So logically, uh, you know, in contrary, contrarily, right? If you stop or block the action of dopamine by giving dopamine antagonists, that will block the pleasurable experience of whatever stimuli you have you know, looked at before. Other stimuli like presentation of beautiful faces or images of lovers, you know, couples when they look at each other, especially com compatible couples. Right, they feel happy, you know, about that. And this you can see when you put them in a scanner and look at the brain's activation patterns. So you know, if you give cash rewards also, that will trigger dopamine. So the idea that brains, the dopamine is a pressure chemical has been around for, for a long time. Now, more precise experiments to understand exactly how is it, uh, you know, how does it trigger uh, activity of dopamine, of dopamine cells in the brain. Uh, some pioneering experiments on those lines were done by Schulz et al. Uh, in UK. So in this experiment, they were recording from a set of uh, dopamine neurons called a ventral in the tegmental area or VTA. So in this, the, there's a monkey. This is done in a monkey. Uh, the, there is a empty box in front of the monkey, right? And there's a piece of apple inside the box. The monkey, whenever it's given a cue, right, the monkey can put its hand in the box and grab the piece of apple. So here they've done something called is you know uh, conditioning experiments where in the first set of experiments when the monkey just puts its hand in the box uh, and then touches the apple, right? Then the, you see that this uh, black line on top uh, refers to the neural firing, the firing rate of the neuron, which means the neuron is getting active. So moment R refers to reward. So whenever the monkey touches the apple, the neuron is firing. So which means it's kind of consistent with our picture that we already had, which is that if you touch the apple, that's like reward for the animal. The animal likes it, so the neuron is firing, right, to indicate that. So then in second set of experiments, so the, the experimenter gave a conditioning stimulus, like a flash of light, a little before the reward was given. That is, before the animal got to right, uh, grab the apple, it was given a little flash of light. So, so there was flash of light, and after a little while, the monkey was able to grab the apple. So which means that after a few trials like that, the, the, mon the monkey got the hint that the flash of light indicates that it can get to take the apple. So, so the, what happened was after some practice like that, the same neurons started firing right after the flash of light. They didn't even wait for the re reward to come, which means that uh, it seems to indicate that these neurons predict future reward. Right? They don't actually respond to reward, they, they only respond to prediction of reward. Now, if you look at the third set of trials, in this set of trials, just like the previous ones, but only thing is at the time of reward where the monkey is supposedly expecting to uh, put its hand and get the apple, uh, they made sure that the box is empty and there's no apple. So it's a kind of, they cheated the monkey. So it was expecting the apple because there was a flash of light, but when it actually put its hand in the box, there was no apple. So at that time, you see that there is a little uh, dip in the firing rate. So this indicated that the firing rate seems to indicate not just reward, but the reward prediction error. That is the difference between the predicted reward and the actual reward. So that's a very important uh, you know uh, quantity, especially in this branch of machine learning called reinforcement learning. I mean, some of you might have taken this popular course by Ravindran on reinforcement learning, right? You would have learned about all this. You would have identified that this last quantity is nothing but your TD error, temporal difference error. So what is your reinforcement learning? In very simple terms, it is this. You know, if you have a system which takes a stimulus and produces a response, you think of it as some animal. If the response leads to a reward, then the stimulus response connection is further strengthened or reinforced. Right, and uh, if the response happens to lead to a punishment, then the stimulus response uh, connection is uh, weakened or attenuated. You know, think of an animal which is, let's say, sees something like a, some red moving thing, right, and just pops it in its mouth and uh, turns out to be a very juicy bug. So that's like reward for it. So next time when you see it's the same kind of a moving red thing, it will eat it. But suppose that the red bug happens to be a toxic bug and animal had a lot of trouble because of it. Because of eating it, the next time when you see it, it won't, you know, it won't eat it. So this is in essence what uh, reinforcement learning is. Now, if you look at the way basal ganglia is positioned in the brain, it seems to be well poised to perform these kinds of functions. Because if you look at this box, 
there are three kinds of information coming together in this box there is stimulus information response information and uh, reward information stimulus basically comes from your sensory cortex response comes your motor cortex because that's where actions are performed reward comes from this part of the brain which is releasing dopamine because dopamine is, is signaling reward it's a pleasure chemical right so if you look at basal ganglia the sensory motor cortex both cortical areas from sensory and motor cortical areas send inputs to basal ganglia we know that from anatomy and subcranial ganglia also sends inputs to basal ganglia so it is well poised to do you know to serve this kind of function so basically you can visualize what basal ganglia could be doing uh, so you perform some action if you get reward which you know from snc it tells the motor cortex that okay next okay, what you have done just now is very good repeat the same thing under the same condition next time right suppose it gets a punishment signal or a low dopamine signal from snc it instructs the motor cortex look what are you have done just now is bad it's bad for you don't do it next time under the same conditions so to to kind of uh, dramatize it a little bit imagine a monkey faced with two choices pressing a yellow button or a red button it turns out that if you press a, if it presses the yellow button it gets a reward which is in the form of a juice a bit of orange juice or presses the red button it gets some electric shock which is punishment but the monkey doesn't know that right only if it presses the button it will know what what it implies so initially it thinks that both buttons are equally good because it's a naive monkey so then first presses the yellow button it gets reward now it knows that yellow means good it means reward so its weightage for yellow goes up next it tries the red button right and it gets a punishment a shock now it knows that red is bad so if it does this a few times you can see that the, its weightage for yellow goes very high and weightage for red goes to very low or zero so that is an important idea this this kind of a weightage is what is called value right in reinforcement learning literature we will come back to that in a minute now so if so thing is if you have a bunch of choices like that each has some associated reward if you know that certain choices are associated with high reward you go for it or you choose them if you know that certain choices are associated with low reward or negative reward then you don't go you avoid them but this is not, this itself is not enough you want to really come up with a strategy for maximizing your rewards you should also be willing to try out any other possible actions that are available just to see how they are how, what kind of rewards or punishments are given so this tendency is called exploration and i mean there is a it's possible to put more mathematically and further you need to take ravindran's course but uh, i'm just trying to give a very simple in you know, a conceptual description so if you if you, these are the ingredients of reinforcement learning you need to have a reward signal you need to have some notion of value or which acts like a kind of surrogate for a reward signal then you need to be able to explore the action space you need to have action you need to have state if reinf if basal ganglia is doing some kind of reinforcement learning because the major clue is that uh, basal ganglia is receiving all this reward information from snc which means it is doing something with it it's doing some kind of reinforcement learning function how exactly is it doing what are the components of reinforcement learning reinforcement learning how are the mapped down to basal ganglia so reward part is cleared and tdrr part is also cleared now where where is the value information so it turns out if we know from some other neuroimaging uh, studies uh, by you know daw and doherty and a bunch of other people i'm not covering that here that sidearm represents value information so so i'll just take that as, as a case and assume that now we know that sensory information comes from sensory cortex actions you know again performed when you feed it back to uh, motor cortex but where is the exploration right where does exploration big part of important part of reinforcement learning is so where does it happen because if you look at the classical picture it only, only talks about go and no go how to choose good ones how to avoid bad ones but doesn't talk about how to explore and explore new and novel actions right uh, so i'll skip some of these detailed arguments but uh, so we propose just hypothesize that this indirect pathway pathway is the one which is doing exploration in addition to this no go that is avoiding bad actions right so there's a long background to this i'll come to that in a second i just want to give you the big picture right in the beginning so the classical picture is that right high dopamine is go low dopamine is no go but we expanded that picture we propose that that picture has to be expanded so because that is between go and no go you need to have a new regime called exploration regime where for high dopamine you go for low dopamine you can avoid for intermediate levels of dopamine that's when you try out things right various things and explore right uh, why is it necessary how is this hypothesis even valid so before going to computational models let me present some kind of potential evidence from experimental results 
So, for example, people have found that you know people have studied which parts of the brain contribute to exploration when you are trying out different action. Which parts of the brain contribute to that? So, people have found certain areas in the cortex, but people were not able to find anything in the subcortical structures, especially in basal ganglia. But from experimental data, we know that if you decortic take decorticated kittens, that is, as a way of removing the cortex in animals. So, kittens with in which cortex is removed, they are able to search for food and uh, explore. How are they doing it? There must be some part which is exploring, even in the subcortex. So similarly, if you take uh, patients who have lesions of subthalamic nucleus or STN, which is a part of the indirect pathway, they show what is called perseverative behavior. That is, they keep on doing. They, you know, so you, you know that some people are very sticky, right? You give them hints that they have to go, and you are busy about you know with your work. They won't leave you. They are very sticky. So, so that means they keep on persisting and doing something even though they even though it is clear that that action is not working or giving them negative results they keep on doing it like the einstein's quotation insanity is doing the same thing over and over again even though it's giving you negative results or something like that it is so that is perseveration so seen lesions can cause perseveration perseveration is nothing but you know not being able to explore so lesion stn seems to cause uh, seem to seem to damage your exploratory behavior now this is where a major clue comes. There are these studies by Bergman, Nini, and all these people. You know, uh, these electrophysiology people. They found that if you take recordings of neurons from STN and GP, uh, especially under PD conditions or Parkinson's conditions or low dopamine conditions, because in PD dopamine levels are less, they found that the firing rates of neurons are not very different, but the, uh, the there is lesser correlation. That is. Uh, to increase correlation, that means the firing rates are firing patterns are more regular. So that's a, there is a major clue there. We'll come back to what that clue is in a moment. So let us present a very simple model of basal ganglia. We have developed more complicated models later, but uh, just just you know uh, to give an idea of how these kinds of models work. So I promise that this talk will be very generic and no math. But uh, so I'm going to go back and need to go back on the promise just momentarily. Uh, just bear with me for a few slides. So this is a simple model of uh, basal ganglia. So this is triatom, this is the GPE, STN, the indirect pathway, this is the direct pathway. So we want this model to solve this basic problem of reinforcement learning. If you have two actions, right, where you already know the value, one is higher uh, than the other. So you have two actions, A and B. A has higher value than B. If you present both choices, you need to choose A. Very simple. I mean, you can't think of a simpler problem in reinforcement learning. So if you present these two actions, two stimuli like that, uh, to the basal ganglia, it's, you know, what will it choose? How do you make it under what condition will you choose better ones? And especially what is the role of dopamine in this? So we rigged up the model, we put together the model and you have in the striatum there are again different kinds of neurons called medial, medium spiny neurons and they have dopamine receptors. As a long story, I'll, you know, I won't get into all those details, but we have put all that, right? And then there's dopamine signal going to both these kinds of neurons. And input is given, A is a stronger input than B, it indicates how it has higher value than B. Then the STNGP we put together, the STNGP actually form a feed forward and feedback system. Uh, in the feedback direction, there is positive connection because it's a excited neurotransmitter. Feedback is negative because it's inhibiting neurotransmitter. So we have put in all those features. When you do that, you get oscillations, uh, which is also well known. The STNGP is well known for its oscillatory activity. There also the, all this experimental data which says that if you give more input from striatum to GP, then you get oscillation. It will be more input from Cortex to STN, there's a direct connection from cortex to HTN, you know, which is called a hyperdirect pathway. Then again, you have you can induce oscillations, right? Or, or if you decrease dopamine, you, you can induce oscillation. All this is known from experimental data. I just want to show that our model satisfies all those requirements. So this I'm just saying because so some people think that you know these kinds of models simply it's like a deep network where you this input output, you take some data from patients and train it. This is not that kind of model. This is a first principles kind of model where you uh, take data from many sources, electrophysiology, behavior, anatomy, and all that, and put together a model which will satisfy all these different you know, sources of data, which is very uh, painstaking work. Then both these outputs combine in GP and then go to thalamus, which is where the action is selected. So I won't go details of the, into the details of the model, but what we found is very interesting in the model, which, uh, which is something more than what you see in the classical pictures. So delta here in the x-axis is the dopamine level, which is a simplified and abstract variable, which depends on dopamine. And the dopamine level is high, 
the probability of selection refers to probability of selection of the action A, which is a better action. So when dopamine level is high, green refers to choice of action A, which means you choose action A with high probability. When dopamine level is low, you don't choose anything. It's like no go. It's like a Parkinson patient is not able to even move. But when dopamine level is intermediate, something interesting happens, right? It's the purple refers to the probability of choosing the other action, which is a bad action, the inferior action, action B. So, right, so the, you choose the bad action B with a very high, significantly high probability, 0.3. Now, first of all, let me point out that the, the model is completely deterministic. There is no um, random noise added or anything. It's a completely deterministic model. Why is there probability in the action selection? It is coming because of the complex dynamics of the STNGP system. The STNGP system, you know, the feed forward and feedback loops, it produces oscillations. These oscillations, if you have a bunch of oscillators coupled, right, and uh, that can easily produce chaos. And it is this chaotic dynamics of the STNGP, which when it is, right, injecting its, this chaos into the output, which is the GPI, is randomly influencing the actions. And this randomness becomes more prominent uh, the way the equation is set up it becomes more prominent for the intermediate values of dopamine, which is what is causing exploratory behavior, which is what we are saying corresponds to exploratory behavior of the of dopamine of basal ganglia. And this exploratory behavior <coughs> can be modulated by varying some parameters of the network. Like, for example, there's a certain parameter called epsilon s, which is the internal parameter of the SCNGP. If you vary that, right, you can vary this exploratory levels, the epsilon s of this value gives you high exploration. If you increase it, it, you have very low exploration. So that is a missing piece, right? If you add that, you have a more in integral model of reinforcement learning. Basal analysis seems to then pre present itself as a more integral reinforcement learning engine. Without that, it's, it's incomplete, right? So therefore, we said, you know, you need to expand the classical picture into go explore no-go and not just go no-go. Um, so we call this uh, the, the gen policy, that is, uh, go, explore, no go. That's we, call, we have abbreviated as gen. So what I've talked about is what is called a uh, discrete action you know, uh, system. Now, if you expand that to a continuous action space, you can easily show, I can skip some of this math, you can easily show that what the, the same update equations translate into some kind of uh, stochastic gradient descent or you know, some kind of simulated annealing, annealing process by which you climb the value gradient and try to search for maximum of the value. So I'll, okay, I'll set it and I'll, I'll skip that because I promise I'll make it uh, mathematically very simple. <clears throat> so that seems to show, present uh, baseline as a very powerful enforcement learning engine, right? And uh, so with this, we were able to get, uh, able to, with this basic model, we were able to uh, model a wide variety of functions of basal ganglia. Right, because basal ganglia shows uh, deficits in you know, damage to basal ganglia in PD. Shows deficits in many functions. We have shown wide variety of functions. This is some of my students who have done their PhD, and uh, actually Pragati is coming back to India uh, very soon, so I think this month or next month or something like that. Now, uh, all this work also has uh, was consolidated in this book uh, called Computational Neuroscience Models of the Basal Ganglia. So now I'll talk about uh, three functions. All right, and uh, so, and then we'll we'll look at some potential applications to you know potential clinical applications to Parkinson's. The first one is a simple function, uh, which is reaching. That is, how do you model reaching? How do you model how your hand reaches to a target? Right. Uh, so this model again has a, is a pretty large model. There is a cortical loop consisting of motor cortex, right, proprioceptive cortex, referred to your you know input, uh, how the feedback from the joints. Right, and then the output of the motor cortex goes to go to motor cord neurons of the spinal cord, and these outputs control the muscles of an arm, which is a very simple model of an arm. The feedback of the arm comes back to the proprioceptive cortex, and it forms a loop going from cortex to the arm back to the cortex. That's the outer loop. Then the prefrontal cortex, which is the front of the brain, decides my target, my goal, and uh, you know instructs the motor cortex, you know, go to that goal, reach that goal. So then there's inner loop between motor cortex and basal ganglia, right? And within the basal ganglia, you have all these structures that we have talked about until now, right? And striatum, GP, and all those things. So we train this cortical loop first. This is the workspace of the arm. Uh, so the arm can reach all these positions. So again, I'm not going to go into the details of the training and all that. Right, so once you...
Right, so you can see that uh, this first row, second panel, see, you know, first column, second row. You can see that hand chasing, that red dot is the target. You can see the hand chasing, it's still learning, right? Uh, after some time, you can see that it, it will quickly reach to the target. It's chasing target right now. This is activity of different regions. But the same thing now, we produce a PD version of the model by, by doing two things. One is reduce the dopamine level, because that's what happens in PD, because there's loss of cells in SNC. So the SNC releases dopamine, so there is lesser dopamine now. So we, we suppress the dopamine variable in the model. In addition, in PD, you have this synchronized oscillations of STN. So therefore, we vary some parameter in STN so that the activity there becomes more synchronized, less chaotic and kind of more synchronized. So when we do these two things and play with these two parameters, the uh, parameter which controls dopamine level, the parameter which controls activity in STN. For one set of parameters, you see this kind of a tremor in the hand. It doesn't reach, it just you know, sits there and keeps shaking. And for other other uh, set of parameters, it doesn't even move. It's rigid. It's kind of as if it's frozen, which is the kind of thing that you see in a real PD patient. It's quite simplistic, but you see the hint of what might be happening in real PD patient. And other things like you know the movement speed, right? Uh, controls have move faster when they try to make reaching movements. PD people move slower. Also, time to peak velocity. Right, uh, it, it's uh, shorter in case of normal people compared to PD. This is an experimental data, so our, uh, our model results also match the experimental results. Uh, so, so the thing is, you see that if you look at the distance to the target, a normal person is indicated by the blue curve, where you start and then go to the target and you stop there. So, distance you try to make the distance to target zero after a finite time. But in case of PD, the two varieties of PD, there are this. Tremor dominant type of PD patients and rigidity dominant type of PD patients. You can produce both types in the model by by just playing with these two parameters. For one parameter, the hand movement is like this. This looks like tremor. The other parameter, it, it just shows rigidity. It doesn't even move. But this is a simple model. Now let us go to a slightly more interesting model related to Parkinsonian gait. So PD gait is interesting. This is a YouTube video. And last time the doctor showed lots of interesting results like this from clinical uh, setup. So this man is able to walk up to that point, but the moment he sees that square, he's kind of frozen momentarily. Now he's asked to turn around, and that also again triggers freezing. So it's as though momentarily they forget how to walk. They have real trouble for, at that moment, you know, how to walk. And that's called freezing of gait. It takes so much time to turn around. But right now he's off medication, so this is, this is behavior in off state. Now, so we have taken a study by Covey et al. And uh, so where they study this freezing in, in a very strict condition, laboratory conditions. The experiment of Covey et al. looks like this. So if you look at the bottom figure, this animation, that circle uh, indicates a person, a patient. That little red uh, horizontal line indicates a doorway. Right. So one of the things that triggers freezing is a narrow passages or narrow doorways. Right. If we show a narrow doorway, ask them to cross it, they'll have trouble crossing it. They'll just freeze in front of the doorway. Even though the doorway is wide enough for them to go through. So the idea here is uh, this circle indicates a person. So let's say the person is going towards the doorway and is made to go past the doorway. And the person is looking at the doorway. You can get visual feedback of the doorway, which one might look something like what you see in the upper right panel, this kind of a green pulse-like thing. So the thing is, how do you, we, we are trying to pose it as a reinforcement learning problem. That is, when you uh, go through the doorway successfully without banging to the sides, you get reward because that's a target, that's a goal of the task. But in the process of going through the doorway, if you bang to the sides, because there will be some slight wobble when you walk, right? And uh, that that's like punishment. So we have this reward and punishment scheme set up like this. And uh, the input to the system is this visual input, this the visual appearance of the doorway. And output is how do you take the next step, right? So this is a very simple formulation of uh, the problem in, in reinforcement learning terms. So, th so, so here you take the visual input that processes it, that sends it to the system, which will uh, plan the next step, delta x, delta y, the next step, and then the agent moves to one step ahead. And visual, your visual feedback changes and the loop closes. This keeps going on and on. And based on the reward feedback, it learns the value model and uses the value model to walk. So when we train this, we train this under normal conditions and PD conditions. What does that mean? Just what we did in the previous model. 
In the PD case, we just reduce the dopamine level and also tweak with the parameter in the ST and GP. And, and all the rest is just like before. We found that again in the PD case, so if you look at the upper curve is from the experimental study. They found that uh, when the doorway, they've taken three cases of doorway, the wide, medium, and narrow. In case of narrow doorway, the patients don't actually freeze, but they slow down about one meter before the doorway, and then they speed up and go through, right? Which is a very peculiar kind of freezing. And what we found is the model also shows the same kind of behavior. So this, the, the, graduate, the model agent gradually slows down, goes to minimum velocity just before the doorway, and then picks up speed and goes through. So you can see that there is hardly any biology in this. I mean, there is no real basal ganglia and detailed chemistry and all that, very simplistic model. And all that we have done is a simple posit in our, on a reinforcement learning framework. All right, it works, but why does it work? Can we get an insight into this? So let us see this plot. This is showing the value landscape. That is the value function basically tells you some kind of integral of reward. That is, uh, in simple terms, it tells you what is the probability of me going through the doorway when I actually get to the doorway after some steps. So when I'm still far from the doorway, I don't know what will happen because I still can't predict exactly what will happen at the doorway because with a small movement to the side, I'll bump into the sides of the wall and uh, you know, I'll go to the doorway and I'll get punishment. I still can't predict. So far from the doorway, my value is still low. But as, but as I get closer and closer to the doorway, now I can assess my movements uh, better so I know that if I'm right in center of the doorway, if I'm located right in center of the doorway, I'll success, probably successfully go through the doorway and get that reward. So my value when I'm close to the doorway keeps increasing. This is what happens in normal condition. But under conditions of dopamine defici deficit, where I suppress the dopamine level artificially in the model, as the agent gets closer and closer to the doorway, the value keeps dipping instead of going up. This is what happens when you learn under you know, this uh, distorted conditions of dopamine or TDR, and you get this dip, and if you plan your next step based on this kind of a wrong or distorted value function, this is what you see, that is, this is what, that is, you see actually the slowing down. So the experimental studies have looked at many parameters. So looked at stride length and step, step length. Stride, so when you take steps with right and left feet, this uh, distance is called stride length, this is called uh, step length. So the first study by Covey et al. Uh, has looked at the stride length. And here they looked at three cases, control that healthy people, then PD on people, that's PD people who are on medication, and PD off people, people, people who are on, who are not on medication. So you see that, uh, you have seen that PD patients walk with short shuffling steps. So their step length or stride length both will be smaller than normal person. So you see that happening here. But PD on people are slightly better than PD off, so they are slightly bigger step length. PD off are the worst. And bottom, you see the model results uh, pretty much capture the same trends. In the second study from Almeida et al., again, they here they are comparing controls with two subcategories of PD patients, non freezers and freezers, because there are some PD patients, they don't freeze, they don't have this problem. Right? Why does it happen? So we had to tweak the parameters in the network and found that if you tweak two other parameters, uh, especially one called sigma, which roughly corresponds to, which controls the exploration levels, and roughly in biological terms corresponds to a chemical called norepinephrine. If you tweak that parameter, we were able to capture freezers. If that parameter is, is sufficiently high, then the, the model behaves like non-freezers. So this is one area where you can see how the model can give insight into what is happening in the brain, instead of just looking at the whole problem in terms of input and output. So model also captures other properties which are you know studied by the experimental studies. There's another something called coefficient of variation. That is how much variability is there in the step size. So normal people walk with a more steady gait rhythm, whereas PD people have a lot of variability in the gait rhythm. And experimental people, experimental studies show that, and model also reflects that. So a lot of things from the experiment can be can be reflected in the model. But so this is to me all the first explanation of uh, freezing of gait. Until then, I've seen papers which talk about which medication works for freezing or you know how much DBS parameters must be used for freezing to, to treat freezing, freezing and things like that. But it doesn't explain why there is freezing in the first place. So this, this freezing study also gave rise to other interesting ideas, which is uh, which could potentially be applied to architecture. So for example, what we have in this model is, if this is the agent, this green in this case, let's say this is U. If you go move up in this direction, there's nothing there, so you can walk safely in that direction. 
So I can associate a value to the direction and say that in this direction, I have high value. But if I try to move leftwards, there's an obstacle there. So I'll bump into it and, and I get punishment. So my value in that direction will be low. So if I have some kind of built up area, like a room or an apartment or something like that, you can put some, associate some value to different direction, wherever you are, right? And construct some kind of a value landscape for the entire apartment. Right, and if you model, develop those kinds of models with you know with all this AI and you know, deep learning and things like that, can we come up with better ways of assessing how comfortable a given building or an apartment is uh, for living? Right, can we talk about quality of life or comfort level of a building? So these kinds of you know, concepts can probably be applied to architecture, but we haven't explored that. But there's a very potential area of work uh, that can be attempted. So finally, I come to another theoretical extension of all that I talked about. That is the role of basal energy and build action. So you know that you know, action means some kind of a movement, such as with your hands or some kind of motor movement. Here again, there are many different categories of action. The simple reflexes, which are conducted at very low level in the nervous system by the spinal cord. Then there is voluntary movement where you have to willfully or voluntarily initiate action. Now, even, even among voluntary movements, there are two different categories, which was which were distinguished way back by William James in the late 19th century. He talked of two different kinds of movements, the ideomotor movements, which are where there is some kind of an idea or a plan that drives the movement. Suppose you are a dancer or a karate artist, right? You are making a perfect some kind of a movement where for which there is a plan, you have you have trained on that and then you you execute that plan. Such movements are called ideomotor actions. Then there's wheeled action where at every step, I mean, I, I suddenly I want to lift my hand, right? At every step, I'm consciously driving that movement. So this is kind of, it's driven by pure will. This is called a wheeled action. Now, okay, you can split hairs like that, but is there anything like a neural substrate, a kind of a neural underpinning to this, where I can take some measurements on the brain and say, hey, this is a wheeled action, this is not a wheeled action. Suppose I throw a ball at you and you're catching it, that's not wild action. You're just responding to sensory stimulus. But if you're moving on your own, that's wild action. Now, is there any uh, neural underpinnings to that? Yes. Thing is, if you are moving your hand on your own, a part of the brain called supplementary motor area gets activated. If you are just responding to some sensory stimulus like catching a ball, then your premotor and primary motor get activated. The SMA will not have much activation. So brain also distinguishes very well between wild actions and sensory driven actions. Now, people knew for a long time that uh, uh, basically has some role in it, in build action. But exactly what is it? Because if you can understand that, that's it. That it will have a tremendous implication to our understanding of what is will. Because if this question of free will is a very big raging question in especially in neurophilosophy. People keep on arguing this forever, but we are not philosophers. Philosophers will let us look at it more in, a, in more scientific uh, neurobiological terms. So we hypothesize, right, uh, that brain, so how does basal anglia that contribute to build action? We said that basal anglia acts like some kind of an amplifier, right? Why does it need to amplify? Because we, we propose that build action comes from some of these highest centers of the brain, like the prefrontal cortex, the supplementary motor area, or pre-sub, pre-SMA, pre-supplementary motor area. And this signal leads amplification for it to be executed. So you have a will, but if you want to X manifest that will, it needs to be man, man amplified, right? And basically has a role in it because we know that if you basically is damaged, people have lots of build, build action disorders. That's known clinically. Excuse me. So the signal originating from the prefrontal <clears throat> goes to the basal area, from the, right, and then goes back to the cortex, loops through this cortical basal area loop. And in this process, it gets amplified. And we propose that it gets amplified by the process called stochastic resonance, which is a well-known phenomenon in physics and dynamical systems and all that. So uh, so, in, so what is stochastic resonance and how does it work? Let me give a simple point as a description of that. Suppose there is a potential well, which has two minima, right? Two wells. And I, I throw a ball in it, right? Depending upon where you throw the ball, <coughs> the ball either settles down in the left well or in the right well. Now interpret these two potential, this potential well in terms of movement. Let's say in my movement, I want to go from my certain home position to a target position. 
both are equilibrium positions. I call uh, this left one my home position or extreme position. This second position I call it the target position. So once it's the equilibrium, I need to give it a kick because I want to um, need to will and move this hand from home position to the target position. So what happens in uh, reinforcement in uh, stochastic resonance is if if uh, if you leave the if you drive this ball right with a forcing signal, right? If the forcing signal is too weak, it will just push the ball back and forth within the same will. It won't be able to push the ball over this barrier to the other side. But it turns out that in addition to the to a weak forcing signal, if I add some noise to it, noise with certain optimal spectral characteristics, then the weak forcing signal and the noise together will be able to push the ball over the barrier. And not only that, the ball will be following your weak forcing signal fairly faithfully, right? That is that is uh, what was weak uh, in itself, right? Was was amplified by the process, right? By this interesting combination of uh, this kind of a potential function and noise addition by this com with this judicious combination of dynamical features, you are able to amplify a weak signal and uh, make the ball go over to the other side. We propose that something like this is happening in the brain between cortex and basal ganglia. And uh, so we showed that the noise amplitude is optimal, right? You move to the, you reach the target with high probability. But if noise amplitude is too low, then you hardly move, right? If noise amplitude is too high, you move, but you kind of, you do this without stably going to the other side and staying there. Now, this is similar to what's happening in PD. It's like as though the healthy person is poised at the level of this optimal noise, the noise is too low, then the person has trouble movement. It's like a hypokinetic condition. The noise is too high, then the person is doing this uh, kind of a hyperkinetic condition, which is what you see in certain baseline disorders like you know Huntington's chorea or dyskinesias in case of right you know late stage PD where you take when you take drug you see dyskinesias. So a normal healthy brain is poised, healthy baseline is poised in this optimal condition. Because of disease, it gets pushed over to one side or the other, and uh, you see either you get pushed over to the hyperkinetic or hypokinetic conditions. So you see that in the simulation, it's a very simplistic simulation, and we can develop it to a more detailed model. But in a normal case, when you give it a kick, right, and I'll also give the optimal noise, it will go to the other side and stay there. But in the uh, in the two disease conditions, like uh, kinetic rigidity, the noise is not enough, then it doesn't move to the other, go to the other side. If noise is too much, then uh, there is it looks like a tremor or a dyskinesias. So our interpretation is that this noise, or what we call noise, is coming from the indirect pathway STN because you know of all this altered, you know, synchronized oscillations of STN in the in Parkinsonian conditions. And the potential well, which is an you know, important part of stochastic resonance, corresponds to your value profile, your value landscape. So noise addition and value landscape, and then the particle basin on your loop gives you uh, so kind of a hill climbing dynamics over the value function. So all the things that you need for uh, structural surface resonance to work, it's happening in basal ganglia in the cortical basal ganglia system. So this is what we proposed some years ago. So I'll skip that. So this is a I've shown you some simple models, but we have actually explained it and made it more detailed also. At every level, the models show the same picture, and we also did uh, work on serotonin, another important uh, neuro implant basal ganglia. This was uh, work done by uh, the PhD student uh, Prakati, and uh, she was jointly guided by Dr. Ravindran. And uh, this was a very interesting work. Uh, Prakati tried to reconcile three different theories of serotonin action into an integral model. This is further expanded to a model of bipolar disorder. So in clinical applications area, uh, Alekia developed a model of deep brain simulation. And uh, then more recently, uh, my two PhD students, Vignan and uh, Sandeep, they were able to develop a very detailed model which looks at the effect of dopamine, uh, so effect of L-DOPA, which is a standard well-known uh, PD drug on the moments. That is, uh, how does L-DOPA control the on-off uh, periods of a PD patient? This is still under review, but a detailed model of agency was already published. So where are we going with this? If you have a model like this, what can you do in terms of clinical application? So this part is a bit of you know, science fiction. This is yet to be done. All right, this is where we make contact with the clinical world. The idea is uh, 
So normally in PD, uh, you know, in the clinical setting, people look at what is called UPDRS scores. These are, you know, the measure of performance of PD patient, uh, which is based purely on inspection. You observe the patient and rate the various functions of patient uh, in numerical terms on a scale of, uh, I think, zero to five. But what we propose is uh, let the patient do some actual tasks, like a quantitative task in the clinic, which can easily be implemented on a smartphone. Right. And, uh, you know, for example, let them play this gambling task, which tells you about the decision making. Let them walk and give their uh, walking samples. Right. Let them give some handwriting samples or speech. And you can extract some parameters from all this and put this data into the model and get extract some meta parameters of the model. Then what you can you'll be able to do right hypothetically is that you will be able to place the patient in certain part of this meta parameter space. So there are many subcategories of of the disease. And once you have that kind of model, you have a kind of a patient specific model. It's like a, that model is like a digital twin of the patient. Then whatever treatments you want to give, you apply it, uh, you apply it on the model. You simulate it first on the model. There's DBS or drugs or some combination of the two. You do all that on the model first and optimize your, uh, you know, your treatment uh, parameters. And then you give it to the patient. Instead of doing trial error on the patient, Right, you do this first on the simulation and then do it on the patient. But let me tell you right away that it's easier said than done because you need to do extensive modeling and also close collaboration with patient data before you can uh, you know, clearly do that. The whole idea is to put clinical neuroscience and therapeutics on a more quantitative model driven footing so that uh, the whole process of treatment of a neurological disease is very rigorous and scientific, right, and uh, model driven. And not just, you know, based on the doctor's experience and gut feeling and things like that, which is what seems to be happening right now. Uh, because you cannot think of a single major, major neurological or neuropsychiatric disorder, which can be said to be cured, right? It's always so many, you know, provisions and conditions and, uh, right, you can manage the disease and you can give palliatives. But, you know, the way you, you know, treat like malaria or something, there's nothing like a cure for a, for any of the major neurological disorder, unless it's infectious disease or a simple case of surgical intervention, all right? Uh, so I think the problem arises because we don't have good understanding of the brain systems level. If you can make progress in that area, important area using certain kinds of computation modeling, then you can really, I think, revolutionize clinical neuroscience. Uh, so I am really thankful to all the collaborators, uh, especially Ravindran was our uh, reinforcement learning guru who taught us all the basics of reinforcement learning and also contributed a big way to the serotonin dopamine work of Pragati. Then Bapi Raju was Sinovas Babu at uh, CMC and uh, Ahmed was a long-term collaborator on the basal idea part. Then Dr. A.B. Sinovasan, uh, again, who was a movement uh, expert. I would still like to collaborate with him on some of the clinical work. Uh, Professor Shunichi Amari, I was spent like, you know, two summers in his lab, a great inspiration for me. A senior person in this field and the students who have de developed various parts of this work in, you know, in their PhD thesis, Pragati Alekya, Vignesh, Vignan more recently, Ankur, and you know, Maitri did work on Sakads and you know, Maitri and Deepika also, and right, uh, Magdum again, early work on reaching Ravi on Sakads and Sanjeev and Sidharan. Sidharan is by the way, right now, faculty in neuroscience in uh, IISC. Uh, sponsors again, thank you and uh, happy Diwali once again. So, hope I haven't taken too much time. Uh, if you have any questions, I'll try to answer. So, uh, see, uh, I have yeah. a question. Yeah, Ravi, go ahead. So, so uh, I mean, uh, so these models that we have, right? Yeah. So, how how customizable are they to individual patients' idiosyncrasies in their response and things like that? I mean, I know that they are. No more yeah. models and expectations. Yeah, it's a key problem. So I actually forgot mentioning that right now with Sandeep's thesis, what we're trying to do is we're trying to create some kind of a canonical BG model. Mm -hmm. Because the thing is, this is where I feel computer models must make connection with the deep learning models. Because deep learning models are good at learning just about anything. Only problem is they are not sufficiently, uh, you know, constant in, in neurobiological terms. Mm -hmm. So the judicious combination of the two will make, let you create models which have sufficient biological realism, especially as the key parts. And it will be able to, for example, 
if you make a patient uh, you know learn some task you know some reaching or whatever mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. with the deep learning padding you can make the right before and front end and back end and all that you can make the system learn that task right now the question how do you pick the meta parameters of the baseline area part of the model mm-hmm. so that it behaves in a bad way like the way patient behaves that is yet to be that is this is a agenda the next part of the agenda okay. but uh, once we add that deep learning you know just a deep network you know you can actually learn each one okay uh, well, otherwise what we have seen the kind of problems we have seen so far are all toy models the kinds of people think models are you know, toy problems the kinds of problems that neuroscience people you know take up in in modeling <laughs> right so the, which is where you need to make a bridge between these two if you want to make a real solid clinical application sure i mean so i have my very good question i have my own skepticism about what deep learning models learn but <laughs> that's a different <laughs> thing <laughs> that's a different thing yeah no but you can make these models more powerful by giving uh, adding a sure, real p- padding Okay. Very interesting. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Thanks for the talk. It's it's great. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. No questions. Uh, this is like my class. <laughs> Total silence now for every class. Uh, okay, no questions. Yeah, go ahead, Karthik. Yeah. Ah, yes, sir. So, so yeah. I just had one question. I'm not sure if this is very related to it, but so in case uh, going a bit deeper into all the research that you've done on dopamine release and uh, the functioning of basal ganglia, but for different people, as Professor Balram also mentioned, for different people, even. uh dopamine release is controlled by certain factors right for example hey, it's, 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 sorry sorry i have to stop you there it's ravindran yeah yeah okay it doesn't like to be called so. okay 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 fine professor yeah. yeah sorry for that okay so no for taking the same task and asking the task to be performed by different people the amount of mm-hmm. dopamine that's get released might differ yeah. from person to person yeah so in case we want to model that how can you go a bit deeper on what influences that factor and yeah. how you even go about it See, I mean, I agree that brain is super complicated and so many variables and all that. Mm-hmm. But uh, thing is, you can you know this uh, favorite expression: all things being equal, mm-hmm. right? You know, if you if you can just isolate because the disease is in basal ganglia, we know that, mm-hmm. right? So can we model only that part and you know calibrate it using behavioral studies from patients? Because you you will never know what is the firing rate, surviving pattern of I mean, unless you do very invasive experiments. In a patient, you can't get all that. but let me tell you then what is the where is the hope i mean can you even apply these models to, to real patients let me tell you, if you look at the gate study mm-hmm. that i talked about before mm-hmm. so we took this uh, you know behavioral results from uh, those, those two studies mm-hmm. right and plugged it into the model mm-hmm. and now we were we had to optimize only the meta parameters so that it will behave like that those studies mm-hmm. and then this this guys vignesh and pragati they found that Mm-hmm. In addition to suppressing dopamine, which is the first thing that you would do, right? You know, because mm-hmm. to simulate PD, mm-hmm. they also have to tweak with two other parameters. One is exploration, mm-hmm. alpha, whatever, right? And then mm-hmm. another is uh, uh, serotonin. So, so mm-hmm. sorry. Oh yeah. So gamma or discount factor, which corresponds to serotonin. So point mm-hmm. is, uh, the model kind of forces to vary those two parameters also for you to match the patient better. now the question is uh, is are these two these two parameters correspond to serotonin and norepinephrine the question mm-hmm. is do real pd patients have deficits in norepinephrine serotonin also because we always mm-hmm. think that it's only dopamine the mm-hmm. answer is yes they do have deficits in these two also so then mm-hmm. the model specifically say for example in the second study almeda et al mm-hmm. they should they look at freezers and non freezers both are pd right mm-hmm. both are pd both have low dopamine then what is the difference between freezers and non freezers what is the distinguishing factor the model if you ask the model what size it is okay freezers have much lesser uh, parameter which corresponds to norepinephrine compared to non freezers hmm. that means that subcategory of patients have not only dopamine deficit but also norepinephrine deficit this is what the model predicts okay now in general we know from other studies that in pd it's not just dopamine we also have deficits in norepinephrine and serotonin it is known from many other studies mm-hmm. and the model is exactly indicating that so point mm-hmm. it is able to make contact with you know give insights into what is happening in the real pc pd patients brain <coughs> but mm-hmm. to get 
all the parameters in line and you know make the exact replica of PD patient, it's practically impossible with current technology. You can only you can only make do with what you have, some behavioral data, some imaging. But even the imaging data is to combine that with the model, it's very hard. <clears throat> That's why I propose this more as a framework and as a kind of a dream situation mm -hmm. because uh, I find it appalling, you know, how badly uh, PD patients or even any neural disease are treated. Mm -hmm. I keep oh. joking, it's a, just a right joke uh, in my class that, I mean, if you want to get get a disease, get any disease, but don't get you know, any neuro disease. Because mm -hmm. the treatment mm -hmm. is pretty strange, you know, it's very illogical. And like, you know, bipolar, you know, you give this lithium, you don't even know why it works. It works, so you take it. I mean, what is this? All right. Right. And so that is a situation, it's just hit and trial, some random empirical results tell you that this is the best you can do and just, you know, just live with it. Whereas I would like a completely scientific, the way you treat a two-wheeler, right? you give a two-wheeler to a mechanic, he'll treat you perfect, fix it perfectly, right? It'll tell you where the problem is. That's how we need to treat the brain. That's a, that's a dream, right? Mm -hmm. Whatever we can do to get there, we need to try that. It's very hard, but you need to get there. Otherwise, what is happening right now is appalling. <clears throat> but but while with the help of these models, are we going towards a yeah, better yeah, treatment so or a cure? Yes, yes. Like, uh, is yeah, it a lot... better treatment or a cure? Like, how are we going to go towards the? That cure? is, uh, for example, uh, two things. It will tell you how to uh, because the last time you know when the doctor presented, we saw how difficult it is to find the optimal DBS parameters. Mm -hmm. That patient himself or herself is given some controls because what how much can the doctor do? Right, and mm -hmm. that's also not sufficient. Right. So whereas if you have a very detailed simulator, all the things you would like to try on real patient, which but you cannot do for obvious reasons, you can try on the model. If it's a detailed and extensive model, you can try many things, and maybe you can it'll even throw up you know, new possibilities, and then you can start thinking on new direction. Why why not this new chemical you know which might act on this part of basal ganglia, and the combination will give you this result. Take for example, there are many different classes of uh, PD drugs. Right, there is uh, you know, dopamine is only first line of defense. Then you have dopamine agonists and MO inhibitors and a whole bunch of things. Mm -hmm. and people give combinations. What combination is ideal for a given patient? You know, it's all you may as well toss a coin and decide. Mm -hmm. And if you Lord. look at the clinical literature, they'll give you a big flowchart. I mean, where does flowchart come from? It's a lot of empirical results from lots of clinical studies. But I mean, I'm not. I want to really get insight into what's happening in the brain and give a scientific answer, rigorous answer. Even if it takes 10 years, 20 years, I don't mind, but I mean, I, I want that. So, so try to, we'll try to walk in that direction. Call it, Professor. Yeah, sounds perfect. Thanks for that. Look, any other questions? Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, then uh, thanks a lot for coming, right? And enjoy your Diwali. And uh, happy, for the class, happy Diwali, everyone. Happy Diwali, everyone. And for the class, guys, let us meet again. Uh, next class, okay. Friday, I'll probably cancel it because this year take, take it as a Friday class. Maybe there'll be a demo by Sunday. Otherwise, we'll meet on Monday. Okay, thanks a lot, guys. Okay. Uh, thank you, Ravi, again. Thanks, you know, Sandeep. Thank you, sir. Okay. Yeah, thank yes. you, sir. Bye. Thank you, sir. Thank yeah. you. Bye. Sundari, are you there? Yes, I'm here, yeah. Why am I not able to stop the recording? Uh, so you have to press those three buttons.